Hi, my name is Matt Winley, and this is Kirsten Pacheco. Uh, we represent Drill Team Dynamics Incorporated. Drill Team Dynamics travels the country uh, helping and assisting programs uh, as they develop their competitive drill team units. So today we're going to talk about uh, a topic that we get asked about a lot, which is how do you become a better trainer. Um, we want to start by talking about the qualities of uh, the person that's going to be doing the training. So in other words, uh, the things that those, those people need to be thinking about uh, and the things that they need to do to become the best trainers possible. First things first, as the trainer, you're going to have to make sure that you understand the intricacies of all of the moves that you're going to be teaching. Meaning, as you're teaching the moves, you need to understand what parts of the body you need to use or manipulate in order to make the move occur in the way that it's required for the team to be successful and competitive. So, along those lines, you think about arm exhibition training, right? Uh, if you've been doing it a while, you probably know the correct way to execute a single spin. Well, in addition to that, don't you also need to know all the possible ways that it could go wrong and all the individual mechanics that can cause certain outcomes. Uh, and so, when you're training someone, not only telling them what the right way to do something is, but being able to quickly explain uh, why they're getting an outcome that maybe isn't correct and how that minor adjustment on your left wrist as you come up is going to cause the rifle to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and knowing your own drill and your own mechanics well enough uh, to be able to communicate to that person uh, why it is that it's not coming out the way that they had hoped. Especially because the things that you're going to see happen over and over again that are not the correct way of doing it are going to be basically the same things. You know, as we've seen for each school that we go to, is the same. We fix the same things everywhere. Uh, yeah, it's it's really true. Uh, you know, if you talk about uh, Marine Corps order Air Force drill, right? Uh, one of the things that you have to be mindful of is keeping a straight leg. Well, we know uh, as trainers from a lot of experience, and you have to develop this as well, uh, that there's going to be certain things that, that people do that are pretty consistent, and you need to figure out the best ways to address those to create the outcome uh, that you want. You need to be able to do that not only in exhibition drill, but also regulation, also color guard, uh, or inspection, whatever you happen to be involved in. Especially because, you know... There are so many things to think about when it comes to drill. You know, your job as the trainer is to take the thinking out of the drill and be able to explain to them in such a way that they only have to do what you're telling them to do and that they don't have to think about it. Because again, a lot of times the people you're teaching who are new are going to be freshmen. So you've got to really be able to take the thinking out of it. So that Because when they start thinking, they're thinking about keeping a straight leg and about turning their foot this way and turning the right way and standing still and not looking around. That's so many things for them to think about. Then they're thinking about all that stuff and they're not getting better at the drill, which uh, you know we've seen a lot of people say, you know, it's really frustrating. It takes a really long time to teach them. You know, we have really kind of found out that taking the thinking out of it makes everything go a lot quicker. And then once they get the move, Whenever you put the thinking back into it, okay, now you're doing it right. Now think about going quicker, or now think about adding this pause. The sharpness is going to come after that. So it's basically an approach where, as opposed to teaching uh, your new people everything that there is to know about drill and then trying to come back and scrape out those bad habits and really get in and try to clean, it's not going to work uh, nearly as effectively as if you take the time at the very beginning uh, to really break a movement down, even something as simple as left face or right face. Uh, and train the proper way to do it. That way you won't spend the second half of your season playing catch up trying to fix habits that occurred uh, because you went too fast through the teaching process. Uh, and if it happens in regulation, you know it magnifies times 10 when it comes to exhibition. Uh, so really taking the time to establish a good foundation and being willing to move a little bit slower, I guess, at mm -hmm. the beginning, uh, so that you can move light years faster as the, as the season progresses is super important. You know, a lot of times one of the ways we start is we start with facing movements. You know, we start with right face and left face and we teach them, you know, how to apply the force. So later on when we get to pivots, it's the same type of force. So when we get there, we say, okay, do you remember what we did with the facing movements? And then it happens that it goes a lot quicker than saying, okay, now you have to do this, this, and this. You know, because then by doing it and segmenting and doing each thing separately, you're taking a lot more time and you're making yourself work a lot harder. Whereas if you can build the concepts on top of one another, it's going to be a lot easier for you and it's going to be more efficient. And then, it's going to be, again, it gives them less to think about because all of the concepts apply together. So they're thinking about less concepts versus everything being completely different and worrying about all of the other things that are encompassed in drill. Uh, and, and so to take an approach where 
you're simply trying to get them to the correct movement and all you're doing is reiterating, no, that's not correct, no, that's not correct, no, it needs to be this way, uh, really kind of fails to take into account their situation. Uh, you want to, like Kirsten said, take the thinking out of it so that all they can do is the thing that you want them to do. But that requires that you be familiar enough with everything that you're doing uh, and, and be good enough at communicating to them what it is that you want to see uh, so that that happens. Uh, the communication piece is huge because we know uh, everyone learns a little bit differently, right? We have different learning styles. Uh, some people react differently to different types of feedback, or correction, right? Uh, and so you as the trainer need to be able to figure out how that particular individual learns best, you know, demonstrate to them or talk them through it or a combination of both or show them uh, and, and really figure out what makes each individual tick to get the best result out of it. That's also going to help the individuals, you know, from getting frustrated, from them not being able to understand you and that communication piece being kind of weird and like well, stringent. Yeah, and, and typically speaking, I mean, junior ROTC is a, a military activity and so, um, you know, the, the, the patience level of the senior leadership or the, the returning cadets uh, tends to be very low because the stress level is supposed to be elevated. It's a military activity. Uh, but remembering that uh, while you may have two, three, four years of uh, experience doing something, these people coming in, you know, if you keep yelling at them to have bearing, well, what is bearing? Did you take the time to explain what bearing looks like? Uh, did you take the time to explain, you know, how they're supposed to be acting? Or are you just screaming a foreign word in their face and expecting them to have a certain response. You know, and as you get later on in the year, obviously you can get more hard, but it should be a very easy learning environment to begin with where they're comfortable, one, messing up, and two, not being afraid to put themselves out there because that's how you're going to be, able, that's how you grow as a team. Uh, doing drill, like you said, not a natural thing. Uh, to do it for a sustained amount of time, even for two hours, might be totally fine for you as a second or third, uh, fourth year cadet, but remembering that at the beginning of the season, we have to bring it back down to the point where uh, we can actually start small and build and kind of push them for longer lengths of time each practice, knowing that we're not going to drive people away because they sit at attention for 45 minutes on their first day of drill. No one wants to be involved in, the, in, in that kind of a process. Uh, and, and so this is as much of a recruiting and retention issue as it is an issue of being a really good trainer. Well, right, because one of the things that's going to do is a lot of people are like, oh, we want to be super hardcore, and then only the people who are left at the end of, you know, our super <laughs> hardcore thing, those are going to be the ones who are going to build the team. Well, yeah, those people might be your super hardcore guys, but then what about those people who are right on the edge, who maybe could have been really good, and maybe, you know, later on at the end of the school year when someone fails and you have nobody, you know, could have been someone to take that spot by slowly building it up, Yes, it's not going to be as hardcore. Yes, you're going to have to, you know, probably tone back a little bit than what you're used to. But you're going to keep a lot more people and your team's going to grow.